Hello, everyone. Welcome to yet another episode of Podwood State. I'm Matt Pillis. My name's Sam Brungo. Joined uh, with us for the first time as an official host, we have Grace Cunningham. Grace, how's it going? Pretty good. Excited to be an official host. Very excited. We also have joining with us two new members of our team. We have associate producers, Jordan Mansberger and Will Hutchinson Pegler III. Guys, how's it going? How's it going, guys? Thanks again uh, for having me back. Excited to have the uh, official title now. It was another another fun episode. Excited to be on the podcast. Yeah, it's great to have everybody on here. It's nice to see, you know, the pod family growing. I mean, all you guys have been on here before, but to kind of get the official connections and everything, it's great to see as one of the granddaddies of the pod. It's nice to see my, my kids growing up, you know. Uh, but we had uh, another awesome uh, interview today. Um, Tom Verducci, uh, big wig at Sports Illustrated, really well-known baseball writer, also known for his work on MLB TV, and Fox Sports. Um, awesome chat. That was great just to nerd out with him about baseball. I know all of us uh, had tons of questions for him after the interview about different little things. Um, but Sam, what did you think? I thought it was awesome. Yeah, it was really cool. I mean, uh, four of the five of us here are um, comm majors, so it's just kind of cool to talk to him. He's the most outstanding journalism graduate in his class, 1982 at Penn State. You know, he uh, he talks about his time at Penn State a lot and how that shaped uh, where he is now. He talks about his career, uh, some cool stories that he's made along the way. And yeah, it was a really fun conversation. Here's our conversation with Tom Verducci. Tom, how you doing? Thanks for joining us. Doing great, thanks for having me. Yeah, so I guess first off, just to get started, I mean, you know, Penn State alum. Uh, how did you make that decision back in the day when you were applying to colleges? How did you make that decision to, uh, to land up at Penn State? <laughs> well, it's an interesting story because uh, my dad was a high school football and baseball coach. And in summers, once in a while, he would coach at Joe Paterno's summer football camp at Penn State. And I was just a little kid. I tagged along a couple of times uh, going up there to see the campus when he was there. Obviously, I love the campus, a great place. And it sort of became my unofficial school just because that was my connection to it. And I was lucky enough, I knew really early on what I wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to be a writer and I loved sports. So I figured why not combine the two of those? And then I did a little bit of research that Penn State had more than just a, a pretty good football team, but had a good journalism department. It just made perfect sense for me. And um, it really was like my one top choice where I wanted to go. I'm just glad it worked out. So when did you first realize that you wanted to get involved in journalism? Um, probably when I was a little kid, I had a paper route. <laughs> uh, so I grew up with ink on my fingers. Um, you know, I joke half jokingly because I always thought it was cool that, you know, the newspaper would get delivered in the morning. And I was like one of the first people literally who get to see it because I would always read the sports section before I actually delivered it. Uh, but also what really got my attention was being a big baseball fan. I'd watch games on TV and I knew the score of the game, but I always looked forward to how it was presented in the newspaper the next day. Like what did I miss in the game that was right there in front of my eyes? Or maybe it was something somebody said after the game. So newspapers kind of drew me in. Um, my mother was a really big newspaper reader. So we had two or three newspapers around the house all the time. So I will say though, it really started with just a love for writing. I mean, I just see born a certain way. You, you have a, a, a gene to read and write or you don't, it seems like, and I, and I certainly did. So I enjoyed writing. Uh, like everybody would complain when we had essay exams in school. I, I look forward to those. So like I said, combining sports and uh, and writing. Writing's really my first love, but why not write about sports? Because that's just fun. So with sports, you did more than just write about sports, obviously. You were a multi-sport athlete in high school playing football and baseball. How did you choose baseball as really the sport that you would move forward with? And what was it like to uh, balance both of those sports in high school? Yeah, well, I was really lucky because, you know, if I could choose one sport, it would be baseball. I like a bunch of sports, but baseball has always been my favorite. So uh, I actually, my first job, full-time job out of college was actually down in Florida, and I was covering the Miami Dolphins for a newspaper in Florida. And I did that for a year. It was fun. I liked it. And then I got hired at Newsday in New York, where I had done an internship. And I started out covering high school sports, like a lot of people do. And then one day it was um, not, it was about in February, not early part of February. It's probably two feet of snow on the ground. And I was covering, I don't know, Nassau County High School hoops. 
And uh, the sports editor came to the back of the office and he said, hey, we need a Yankees writer. Can you get down to Fort Lauderdale tomorrow to cover the Yankees? And I'm like 22 years old. And at the time, Fort Lauderdale was like the place to go for spring break. So I was on the next thing smoking down to Florida and got down there and, and covered the Yankees. And like I said, it just worked out that that was the beat that was open. They thought enough of me to, to let me go do it. Um, but if I could, I could have chosen a beat, it would have been baseball. So I always say that was my, like my equivalent to a Marine going to Camp Lejeune. It was boot camp for me to go down and cover the New York Yankees pre cell phone days with George Steinbrenner owning the team and a bunch of just killer beat writers on that beat who are, had been there for a long time and had really been established. So, you know, that's getting thrown into the deep end of the pool right away. It was a great training ground. It was intimidating, um, but there was a ton of energy. So I was lucky enough to be exposed to something that was really highly competitive early on in my career. Sink or swim, man. So you learn how to swim, even if it's the doggy paddle. So going back to high school a tiny bit, um, you know, playing football and uh, baseball, uh, you actually had kind of an interesting uh, coaching uh, situation with those two sports. And your dad was actually your high school football and baseball coach. Um, I think that sort of father-son uh, coaching relationship is really interesting. I think we're seeing that sort of play out right now, uh, watching Syracuse uh, and March Madness, watching Buddy Beheim and his dad uh, sort of play together. I think that's been really awesome to watch. Um, so how was your relationship with your father as a coach um, and what did he teach you um, on and off the field as an athlete? Yeah, it was awesome. First of all, by the time I got to high school, he just narrowed it down to one sport. That was enough. So he was just doing football. So he wasn't my baseball coach. Growing up, I'd go to all of his baseball games. But by the time I got there, it was just football. So I kind of grew up not just going to games, but going to practices as well. So I was lucky enough to be exposed to the kind of work that goes in. I mean, as a fan, we always see the results, but for me, I, I got to see what goes into uh, go, what goes into the work before a game. Uh, and that really intrigued me. I, I like things, I, I'm a process oriented person. I'd like to know how the things work and how we arrive at a result and not just what the result is. So he loved what he did. That was a, probably the biggest inspiration for me that um, I could tell that, you know, you're lucky in life when you're able to do something that you would do, even if you didn't get paid, like if you have free time and you're still doing quote unquote work. And that's what he did. Um, always working on football plays and schemes and things like that, watching film, you know, subliminally, I just kind of picked that up by watching him enjoy what he did. So that was probably the biggest lesson for me. And the other lesson I learned certainly was preparation. I know playing high school football, we had really, really good teams. Um, I just felt going into every game, we were going to win because we were super prepared. It wasn't that, you know, it was because we had necessarily the best talent or we had these great halftime speeches, although sometimes we did. Uh, it was more just the prep work during the week. So that's kind of been the foundation for me as a journalist. Uh, you know, I mentioned a couple of times now that I love to write, but behind every great writer, there's a great reporter. I mean, there's no question that that's where it begins. You have to be curious, you have to be detail oriented, but you really have to enjoy the reporting process. So I kind of got that from my dad as well. So I was really lucky, I believe, to, to be in this business and to have that background because I like to think I come at what I do a little bit differently than most people. Uh, most people will cover sports as an outsider looking in. I try to look at it as an insider looking out because I see it almost from a coach's perspective. Um, you know, it, it's, I understand how hard things are and things don't always work out the way you want them to be. Um, but again, I, I think about processes and, and how things work and what goes in it. And sometimes those are interesting stories, more interesting than the actual results. So I actually kind of feel lucky that my perspective on sports is more ground level than it is, say, 30,000 feet above. So you were a Penn State baseball walk-on. Did you always plan to play baseball, baseball in college? Did you look at any other schools or was it always Penn State? Well, I wanted to go to Penn State, not, not to play baseball, just because of the journalism school. And I was kind of crazy enough to say, well, why not just go play baseball? And back then, Penn State baseball really wasn't anything close to what it is now. Um, so they basically just didn't want to get rid of me. And then I was like this extra guy hanging around the team uh, that they humored to have around for a while. But I really enjoyed it. I mean, it was so much fun just to be part of the team and not even playing. But 
even be like a taxi squad guy being around, you know, just teamwork and baseball. And again, it was something that I just love to do anyway. So I was happy doing that. Um, sometimes I look back and I'm like, how did I do all these things? Were there more than 24 hours in a day back then? Because I'd be going to class, then I'd be going to baseball practice in the afternoon, and then I'd be going to the Daily Collegian at night to go either write something or be an editor and, and work on copy, pushing it out that night for the next morning's paper. So it definitely kept me busy. But again, I guess when you're enjoying what you're doing, it, you know, it doesn't seem like work. Class of 1982 graduated from Penn State with a degree in journalism. You were honored as the most outstanding journalism graduate in your class. So how do you think that Penn State College of Comm prepared you for what you're doing now in the sports media industry? Yeah, it was really like having a job before getting into the job market. That's the way I looked at working at the Collegian. Um, and I did some other things too. I freelanced for local high school papers. I did some uh, string work for United Press International covering some sports at Penn State. Um, but really it was the day-to-day -day work at the Collegian. And especially with a football program like Penn State had, to me, it really was like on the job training because, you know, football Saturdays, you'd have the writers coming in from Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, these big time names. And I got to see kind of the way they work, the questions that they asked. I mean, the exposure to a big time football program is also the exposure to big time journalism. And that's what I really got out of it. It was a great experience to, you know, go to these bowl games and, and travel on the road and cover the team like you're really working for a, a, a small daily newspaper, to be honest with you. So, I mean, my professors would hate me, hate to hear this, but I learned so much more outside of the classroom than inside the classroom. And that's not really denigrating the in-classroom experience because those lessons, I, you know, I can still hear some of the things the professor said in my ear today. It just stays with you as the foundations to it. But there's nothing like actually getting out there and making your mistakes, which is really what it is when you're starting out and learning from those mistakes. So I think the Collegian itself and the journalism program on a whole really, really, I thought prepared me well to, to enter this business because I felt like I, I kind of hit the ground running. Kind of sticking with that and going back to your days um, on the Penn State football beat with the Collegian, do you have any like favorite moments that stick out to you um, when you were covering the football team? Any any big games or things like that? Well, the, actually the first time I was an air, on an airplane was my, I think it was my freshman year that Penn State played in the Liberty Bowl in Memphis. I had never been on an airplane before. Uh, and unfortunately had a really bad head cold and my head was killing me as the plane was landing. And I was like, if this is what flying is all about, I don't want any part of it. Um, but it, it was fun, especially for the road games. And um, I really actually enjoyed uh, Wednesdays at Toff's Trees when Joe Paterno would have his little get together with the local beat writers. And, um, you know, we were just these snot nosed reporters from the Collegian. And, you know, I don't think we probably showed them as much respect as we probably should. We were always looking for some kind of quirky angle or something interesting. Um, he humored us. He was, he was great to us. Um, but I remember be, feeling so lucky to be in that environment, you know, that you're included with the beat writers there. And, and it's kind of a, a small group. It's Penn State football and all that, what that's all about. So, um, it was just a great experience all around. I loved everything about it. So obviously Joe Paterno is a little more old school than the coaches that we see now. So for our listeners that don't know what that is really, can you explain to us really what that uh, get together at Toff Tree is really entailed? Yeah, I mean, back then it was really just print media for these Wednesday afternoon sessions. And, you know, we all had stories to preview the game to write or feature stories about some of the athletes on the team. And it was your one opportunity because there wasn't a lot of, uh, windows of opportunity to talk to coaches, especially the head coach, but it was your one window to sit down and ask questions to the head coach. And, you know, the local newspapers would be there as well. Uh, I don't remember it being any TV cameras or, or radio reporters. I think it was just print media. That's what I remember. And it was kind of a casual setting and it was really pretty cool to just have this sort of a conversation more than a strict Q and A about what was going on with the team. So it was a great source of information um, to put our stories together to preview the upcoming week and find out what was going on as much as they cared to tell us. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, uh, I'd say it was, it was more casual than anything else, which I, I really liked. Both sides of your career, um, you know, involve you being known as both a writer and, you know, as a TV guy, right, as, um, as a presenter. 
um, on MLB and Fox Sports. So do you consider yourself kind of a writer first, a TV guy second, or a TV guy first, TV guy second, or have they kind of become like meshed together as the years have gone on? Well, they have meshed, but I got to tell you, I started out just wanting to work in print media. And that's the way it was when I was in school. You did one or the other, and very few, if anybody, had aspirations of doing both. I mean, to me, there was kind of a firewall there between electronic journalism and print journalism. So, I mean, I, I, as I said, I loved writing, and that's what I really wanted to get into. I just wanted to work, start out in the newspaper business and see where it led. I never really thought about being on camera. It didn't appeal to me at all. It wasn't in my aspirations. Um, but, you know, as I got into this business, the world really started to change. And it wasn't so much opportunities, although I was lucky enough to get some. It was just that the media landscape was changing so much and people were becoming much more visual. And there are many more options out there with the growth of cables, cable television. Um, that you know, the more I got into it and, you know, the more I learned about it, the more I started to enjoy it. So it's different. It's challenging. Uh, you know, as I say on TV and you're standing in front of a camera live in a World Series and there's, you know, 11 million people watching you, there's no delete key. There's no second draft. I mean, you, you just have to nail it on the spot. It's not like that when you're writing a story, um, especially for me with SI, we have some time to work on it and craft it and slave over it and get away from it and come back to it. So the energy of it is really different. It's exciting. Um, but it's something I, I came to, I don't want to say reluctantly, but sort of as a, a second option, if you will. So I think deep down, uh, and most of my DNA is in writing, but the more I've done television, the more I really like it. Because when you think about it, it's pretty much the same. Because what we're doing is we're telling stories. And the idea is tell stories in the most interesting way possible. And, um, you know, visually uh, it's just a little bit different than doing it in print, but they're both storytelling. Yeah, you mentioned uh, how there's no delete key. And, you know, recently we've seen some, uh, some announcers and some play-by-play -play people get caught on a hot mic. Is there anything that you've ever said and immediately been like, oh shit, I shouldn't have said that? <laughs> Um, I'm sure there probably is. I mean, um, I can't think of one thing off the top of my head, but you know, I'm like anybody else. I don't like to make mistakes. And even if it's a factual mistake and it, if something comes out wrong or I got a statistic wrong, uh, you know, that bothers me. And you still have to realize you're human. You're not going to be perfect, especially say you're doing a baseball game. It's three and a half hours and you're speaking essentially extemporaneously the entire time. If there's no script you know it's bound to happen where you're going to slip up or you know step on your partner in terms of um you know he's not done with this sentence i can't think of anything that really stands out of one thing but i'm sure it happens because it, as i said you're just speaking a lot in the course of um really unscripted television I, I don't think a lot of people really appreciate how difficult it is um we it's kind of like umpires or referees you know we expect these people to be perfect and when they don't get a call right, everybody notices. And it's just human nature that you're not going to be perfect. And I think it's the same way with broadcasting. It's very easy to say, I can't believe he said that, or did you hear what that guy said? Um, and if it's just a slip of the tongue, you should always give somebody a, a benefit of the doubt. But, you know, I, again, I'll go back to preparation too, because the more you're prepared, the less likely some of those things can happen. Um, you do the best that you can, but again, we're not perfect, just like those referees and umpires. So you've worked with Sports Illustrated, Fox Sports, and MLB Network. How was your, what was your journey like to these different jobs and what are some of the differences between them? Well, before I got to Sports Illustrated, I worked one year in, uh, for Today Newspaper in Cocoa, Florida, and then I went to Newsday. And back then, uh, Newsday, I think, was the top five circulation paper in the country. Um, and pre-internet, working in the New York area, to me, was a benefit because people, at least at Sports Illustrated, which is headquartered in New York, were able to see my stuff. You know, if I was working somewhere in the Midwest, in the South somewhere, maybe they don't see as much of it because copy just didn't, you know, wasn't as readily available, um, at least on an everyday basis. So they were able to see my stuff while I was writing for in, in Newsday and, um, and I was offered a job to go work for SI and I had never even thought about it the possibility of me writing for SI. I mean, that was just like, I mean, it wasn't even a dream because I thought it was just beyond whatever I might do. I was happy with what I was doing. I was covering baseball for Newsday and really liked it. Um, but yeah, the, the opportunity to really write longer stories in depth, 
really appealed to me. And newspapers are great, but what magazines can give you that newspapers can't is the luxury of resources and time. So resources meaning, you know, I can get on a plane if I need to go get somebody to interview for this story, whereas newspapers, eh, maybe not so much. Uh, and time, obviously, a little more time, uh, especially nowadays when, you know, it used to be, it was 24-hour news cycle. Now, I think it's 24-second news cycle. Um, so it's a little bit different. So the kind of the, the flip side is kind of a downside and an upside. I like to think of it as an upside. As a magazine, when you have time and resources, everything you do has to be top quality. In other words, you don't have a corner you had to cut. You don't have an excuse for turning in something that's just run right of the mill. It better be top quality, top of the line. I like that, to be honest with you, but it certainly is challenging. I mean, you know, newspapers, sometimes you just don't have the time. You just do the best that you can to get something in. Um, so I, that appealed to me and, you know, I joined SI in uh, 93, I think. Um, and then the TV opportunities came along later and, you know, I started working with CNN SI that's no longer around and um, then with Turner and then Fox came about and MLB Network started in like 12 years ago. And I mean, the idea of MLB Network to me, I mean, that was like, if I was a six-year-old kid, I'd love that. You're telling me that a channel dedicated solely to baseball, 24 seven, nothing else. I mean, come on. I mean, it's like, to me, it's like cell phones. How did we ever live without that channel? So that was kind of a natural fit for me. And um, I love the fact that it gives me a lot of runway to do a lot of different things, um, whether it's breakdowns, interviews, analysis, games, lots of different ways to kind of present uh, baseball on the network, which is really cool. And, and the vibe there is really, really good. I mean, it sounds corny, but the people who work there really do love baseball, uh, which is the way it should be, but it doesn't always work. Sometimes you just get a job because that's what you got. It's a job. And maybe you're a football fan, but somehow you wound up at MLB Network. Really at MLB Network, people that really do love baseball and the vibe in the building, when we have enough people in there in non-pandemic times, is really pretty cool. So I, I, like I said, the more I've done the TV stuff, also the more I've, I've really come to enjoy it. So you were talking about in college, how you felt like you were running no stop and you were always going and how did you find enough hours in the day? But now you really have a lot going on too. So how do you find balance in your days now? Yeah, well, even when I was in, at Penn State, we had the trimester system then. So I actually got to the point winter of my senior year where I had no more money left. I put myself through college with some loans and summer jobs and things like that. And then I realized like around November, December, I don't even have money to go through a spring term. But then when I looked, I actually had enough credits if I took an extra class for that winter term and I did. So I graduated early and it's a good thing because I don't know what I would have done otherwise. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was busy, but a good busy in a way. And it's kind of that way now. Um, all the jobs that I do sort of interrelate in some way or another, like this week or last week, I've been doing some interviews for Fox that will run in the course of the season. And some of the material of those interviews I can use for stories that I write for SI. So it's not like I'm covering different sports or I'm covering Hollywood and baseball. It's just baseball, baseball, baseball. Um, the only hard part though is doing expenses because you have three employers and you got to make sure you get all those receipts in the right place. I hate doing expenses anyway, but when you have to do them in triplicate, it really stinks. So in addition to all your accomplishments, you also have the honor of being a voter for the Pro Baseball Hall of Fame. And I'm just curious, how do you feel that nobody was selected to the Hall of Fame on the 2021 ballot? Yeah, it always kind of stinks that nobody gets in. And not that I am have to be part of the PR arm of the Baseball Hall of Fame, but I think more of the players themselves. It's such an amazing honor. And if anybody who's ever been there for a ceremony, man, it really hits you how important it is to these people and their families. So I think of it more that way than I do, hey, the Hall of Fame doesn't have anybody to put in. Well, they actually do this year because last year was canceled. So you'll have Larry Walker, Derek Jeter and some others go in this year. But um, yeah, I, I thought, you know, Kurt Schilling was going, he was certainly on track to go in. I knew it would be kind of close. Um, obviously he came up short again. Um, but you know what, the, I, I always, 
think about the process, it's really, really hard. I mean, 75% of about 400 sports writers to agree on something, I mean, <laughs> on anything is super high. That bar is really, really high. So uh, it's happened before, as you know, it's not the first time, um, you know, I'm sure there'll be other years down the road where it happens. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd like to see most people go in. I mean, if you're close, especially, I think it must be just kind of heartbreaking to be close and keep waiting and waiting to get in. So um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, I don't know what next year is going to bring. It's going to be a crazy year with Schilling and Bonds and Clemens on the ballot for the last year, but um, I'd rather see somebody go in than nobody. You know, you said it, how you know hard it is, it can be for guys to re- like get over that hump and, and get enough votes to get in. Um, as a baseball fan myself, I've always kind of been curious for you and, and other voters, what, what kind of goes into like the decision process on that? Um, kind of what, what do you look at most, like over the course of a guy's career, what kind of factors do you consider? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, it's really, really changed in the course. I don't know how long I've been voting almost 30 years now. And it's really changed. And the fact that we have so much information now is really helpful, uh, easily obtainable information. Back in the day, you didn't have nearly as much information. I mean, I would call like the Elias Sports Bureau looking for some not so esoteric information and it would literally take a couple of days to get something back. Um, We did a lot of talking on the telephone, believe it or not, with other writers in other cities, like, hey, what are you thinking? And then you kind of put your best guesses together about precedent, like how does this guy compare to other people who are in? Now I do much more because the information is so available, much more deeper dive analytically, statistically. I like to do my own work. So I keep a running kind of booklet on Hall of Fame candidates. And I have some of the things that are pro candidate and also anti candidate, why he's short or why he is a Hall of Famer. And I kind of add that, like people say, how can you vote for somebody one year or you don't vote for one year and you vote for the next year? He didn't get any hits in the last year. Um, but your opinion should change. The more you, you have to be open to information. So there have been times where information has come up where I looked at it. I'll give you an example. Scott Rowland, I didn't, hadn't voted before. I thought he was just borderline close. Didn't think he had played enough. But then I went back and I looked again and I looked at his totals uh, as they compared to other third basemen in the Hall of Fame or just short. And it turned out that he had enough, in my opinion, uh, Hall of Fame type seasons that measured up against those nine or 10 guys voted in by the writers at the third base position. So you always wanna stay open to ideas. But for me personally, I I like to do a lot of my own work. Um, I can't tell you there's one statistic specifically because it it matters on position, player, year. Uh, I try to compare players to their own era, although sometimes the historical comparisons do come in, but it's always easier to compare guys to the, the ones that they played with. I'll tell you, it's not easy. I mean, it's, it's, I tell people all the time, it's not an SAT test. There's not like right answers or wrong answers. It's just your answers. And as long as you, you bring some homework to the assignment, if you will, then I live with other people's opinions. Like if I don't vote for a guy and he gets 70%, you know, all power to him. He deserves to be in the hall of fame. And the reverse is that as well. If I vote for a guy, I voted for Fred McGriff for years and he never got in the hall of fame you know what? The system said he wasn't a Hall of Famer. So I, I do respect the 70% threshold. No conversation about the Baseball Hall of Fame, I think, can avoid the inevitable, you know, should Barry Bonds be in the Hall of Fame, right? I think he's always one of those first players that is talked about. And, you know, you've you've written about that before um, back in 2013. And you actually said no, that um, any player from that steroid era who, you know, was using at the time should, should not be allowed, um, especially a player like, like Barry Bonds. Um, but you know, that was almost eight years ago. It's kind of crazy to think now that 2013 was eight years ago. Um, but, uh, has your opinion on this changed at all? Yeah, that's one thing that hasn't changed and it's not really a statistical thing to me. People made a conscious decision to cheat the game and to cheat their fellow competitors. They established an unfair advantage. And I'm not taking away records. You've got the home run record. You've got all the money. There's no penalty here. What I'm doing is I'm choosing not to honor the choice that you made. To me, it's no different that I would not advocate Ben Ben Johnson for the Track Hall of Fame or Lance Armstrong for the Cycling Hall of Fame. Uh, And again, I'm recognizing what was done on the field, the incredible talent these guys had. But 
I remember the first time looking at a ballot when some of these guys got on, we had this steroid decision in front of us. I'll tell you what, what goes through my head is all the clean players that spoke to me before I wrote a really big cover story on steroids in baseball in 2002. The impetus for that story was the clean players who were coming up to me and saying, this game is unfair. That I either have to go against my own thinking and, and jeopardize my health to use steroids, or I have to play at a competitive disadvantage. And that's when it clicked for me, like, whoa, this is not just a few players now. This is now tilting the field that players who are playing the game clean are actually disadvantaged. So, you know, I tell people, it's funny, over time, when that story first came out, people were like, oh, you're exaggerating. There's no way people were, you know, using that many steroids, that many players were using steroids. Now, to kind of, the way people do backflips to put steroid users in the Hall of Fame, they now say, well, everybody was doing it. Well, obviously the truth is somewhere really in the middle. Um, but to me, I, I'm just not going to honor and advocate a position that steroid use is okay. I don't care whether you did it in your first year or as they say with people like Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens, they began, you know, when they were already Hall of Famers. No, you're voting on the entirety of somebody's career, not a portion of it. So it, to me, it's pretty easy. And I try to use the same principles that I would use as a journalist, because a lot of people will say, well, how do you really know? Well, think about it. If I'm going to write that somebody was a steroid user, there better be proof, right? So if it's someone, and listen, we, we hear a lot of rumors, as a lot of people do in the business about people, that's not good enough. The fact that somebody got really big one year, that's not good enough. But anybody where there is known proof that they chose to use steroids, I will not vote for them. So you get the benefit of the doubt. And maybe there were some people like the guy who speeds 100 miles an hour, but that day there's no cop car on the street. He's going to get away with it, right? You're not going to catch everybody. So life is unfair in that regard. But the ones we know about, when that cop's there and you're doing 100, you get pulled over, can't complain. So kind of following up on that, um, just diving back into your career, what what stands out to you about, you know, covering that era? Obviously, there's so much, so much was happening on so many different teams, so many different stars were ended up being caught. Um, kind of what do you remember? What stands out to you about covering those really kind of controversial years in the MLB? Yeah, before it really broke, I said it was the worst kept secret in baseball. Um, and again, I, I thought, like, some people want to say retroactively, well, you guys were part of the problem here, you guys were looking the other way. I actually think most of us were being extremely responsible by waiting until there was conversation uh, and confirmation about what was going on in the game. I'll give you an example. Uh, spring training of 1998, before spring training, it was January of 1998, I went to go see Mark McGuire at his house to write a story on McGuire. He had 58 home runs the year before between Oakland and, and St. Louis. The big question is, you know, can this guy break the home run record? So I went out to see Mark McGuire. This is 1998 before the season started. I sat right across from him in his living room and flat out asked him if he used steroids. And he said, no, but I'll take anything that's legal. So he denied it, a plausible deniability, I guess. I mean, what am I supposed to do then? Write that, you know, he's really a steroid user, but he denied it. I think if I remember correctly, I wrote something about that in the story, at least his answer. Um, but I couldn't go another nine yards and say, well, he's actually lying to you people. You know, you, you just can't do that with people's reputation or facts, to be honest with you. So it took a while before a lot of this really did come to the surface um, because there was a lot of talk around certain players, certainly Jose Canseco in, in those days as well. So then when it broke, I mean, it, it was like, I don't know whether players, I think most players were actually happy when the story broke and baseball had to do something about it because I, I know that in 2002, well, I'll backtrack a little bit. We had a, an offsite meeting at Sports Illustrated to talk about some of the stories you wanted to do that year in 2002. And that's when I told my editor, I said, you know, the story of this year and the worst kept secret in baseball is how many guys are use, using steroids. And I said, we need to write that story. Somebody's going to write it. It better be us. I literally said those words. But I also said, but we have to write the story with attribution because there had been some stories written already, anonymous sources, people guesstimating on what the percentages was. 
to write that kind of a story and really have impact, you really need attribution. And my big break was getting Ken Caminiti to talk about it on the record. A guy who won the MVP admitted he used steroids and, and almost half the players in the game did as well. Um, so that's what really made that story uh, have such an impact because to that point, the Players Association had resisted any talk. I mean, I mean, talk about any talk about having any kind of testing um, that Major League Baseball had uh, offered to do regarding uh, performance enhancing drugs. And once that broke and then Congress got involved, then there was pressure on players to at least do something. Uh, so they had this um, anonymous testing in 2003 and that led to steroid testing with penalties and, and the rest is history as they say. But um, you know that I think it was a weird time in baseball because a lot of people knew what was going on without being able to really get at the heart of it. But I also knew as a baseball fan, it, it kind of, it went both ways, like 98 covering the home run race between McGuire and Sosa. I'm not going to lie to you. It was exciting to be in the ballpark. I mean, people, they're opening gates early and selling hot dogs in the stands just for batting practice. It, the greatest show above earth was BP with McGuire and Sosa. That was before the game even started. It was on the national news when people watched the nightly news. Uh, you know, when was the last time that happened in baseball? So it was really big. It was fun. I think there was always a little bit of that back of your mind that, you know, I don't know if this is all legit, but, you know, this is a fun ride. Um, but then as more players got involved and you saw the bodies just getting cartoonishly big and the game really changing, now baseball went off into a whole nother orbit. So now you could no longer compare eras, not that you could really you know, scientifically before, but as a fan, you'd like to say, hey, this guy's as good as Babe Ruth or whatever. You really couldn't because the numbers just got crazy stupid where now it's off on its own little capsule of the steroid era. And even today, I mean, obviously you haven't seen anybody hit, you know, 60 to 70 home runs like they did back in the day. It was happening almost every year. Uh, so now you really have a sense of how unusual and set apart it was from baseball history. And that was kind of the sad part to me that, I, you know, as a fan of baseball history and kind of connect generations, you really can't do that. That's often its own little capsule. So again, uh, another thing that comes up frequently when having conversations about the Baseball Hall of Fame, you know, the second is, you know, the steroid uh, era players, uh, Barry Bonds in particular. Um, and then the second is Pete Rose. Um, now he's more of an individual case, of course. Um, but, you know, from that sort of inside look that you have in the Baseball Hall of Fame, you know, what What's been sort of the talk about Pete Rose? Like, is there any chance do you think he might get let in at some point? I know that there's kind of animosity on both sides, but what's your take on, on that story? Well, I don't, I don't see a window as we sit here today. Um, you know, forever is a long time, so I can't say forever, but I just don't see or sense any momentum towards that. Um, people forget that, you know, Pete Rose was going to be on the writer's ballot, our ballot to vote for the Hall of Fame. And it was only, I think, less than 12 months before that ballot was going to go out that the Major League Baseball actually instituted a rule with the Hall of Fame that said, if you are on the permanent, permanently ineligible list, you are not eligible for the Hall of Fame. I mean, that was clearly written to keep Pete Rose out of the hall. So my point was, just put him on the ballot. Let's see how what happens to him in the process. Maybe he gets voted in, maybe he doesn't. We're seeing how hard it is for steroid users to get into the Hall of Fame. Um, you know, would he get in? Probably, but I can't tell you it was a slam dunk. I mean, go back to the first Hall of Fame vote, which I think was 1936. Joe Jackson was on the Hall of Fame ballot. He was on the permanently ineligible list. And there were only like two or three writers who voted for him. So he did get involved in the, pro he was in the process. He was on a ballot, wasn't elected. Now, when it came to Pete Rose, they said, oh, wait a second, you can't have someone on that list, even on the ballot. And kind of a Pete Rose clause was put in. And so he had no shot. And I always, I always wanted him, not that I'm a huge advocate for him for the Hall of Fame. I probably would vote for him, but I'm not like, you know, been out of shape about it, but I just feel bad that he never got to go through the process and have the opportunity that Joe Jackson did to be on a ballot and, and see where the chips land. Um, but I don't, I don't see that changing as we sit here today. And by the way, one of my, <laughs> you talk about getting to do a lot of fun things in baseball. Um, one of my crazier things was I actually, this was not too long ago, maybe eight or nine years ago now, 
I took a car that Pete Rose drove from Las Vegas to Southern California. And I went along with him for the ride. <laughs> and just having, I don't know how long that trip was. I don't know, say it's three hours, four hours. And just being in the car with Pete Rose for that long, he loves to talk and he's an unbelievable storyteller. I mean, whether you like the guy or not, he is entertaining. So uh, being captive in the car and listening to him tell stories was, was pretty cool. <laughs> I guess the one thing with, you know, Pete Rose and Barry Bonds, I mean, you know, holding some some records, you know, whether you consider Barry Bonds' home run record to be legitimate, you know, it's up for debate. Um, I'm certainly for giving Hank Aaron that award, uh, rest in peace. Um, but, you know, Pete Rose, also all-time leader in hits, definitely, I look on him, I guess, a tiny bit more favorably. He helped my Phillies win, you know, the series in 98 or 1980. So definitely um, look on him a little fonder, but, you know, sort of the defense I've always heard when it comes to letting players like that in all these different special cases um, is that, you know, the role of the hall is to sort of just preserve history. You know, it's built to sort of be a, uh, a Mecca for baseball and just any sort of history, anything that has to do with baseball, you know, has a place, you know, in the hall. So that's often been a defense I've, I've heard for letting those sorts of players in. Uh, would you agree with that statement when it comes to the hall or do you think it's something else or do you think well, you know sort of its role as a museum and as the hall of fame are sort of separate yeah well people have to understand the name of the place is the national baseball hall of fame and museum so you're talking really about two different things the museum is to me obligated to tell the story of baseball good bad and indifferent whatever it may be so if you're talking about Pete Rose, Barry Bonds, Joe Jackson, they are all well represented in the Hall of Fame. I mean, the Hall of Fame has had steroid exhibits there. So this is not, you know, Soviet Russia wiping out non-persons from history. This is baseball telling the story of the game. Now, when you talk about being honored as a Hall of Famer and being in the gallery of those inducted uh, to the Hall of Fame by either the writers or special committees, that's something different. You know, that's now we're talking about honoring your contributions to the game. And people make a big deal about, they call it a morality clause. It's not about morality. It's about sportsmanship and character. And the fundamental aspect of sportsmanship is to play the game fairly. If you're watching a sport and you think that outcome wasn't generated fairly, that there was something that tipped the scales against your team, you're not happy. I mean, essentially you're watching professional wrestling if the outcome is not legitimate. So sportsmanship is the least that an athlete can do. So that's not a really high bar. It's really not about morals. When I think about sportsmanship, I think about what happens between those lines, right? I'm not saying there's the hall of fame itself is full of choir boys and, and, model citizens. It's not. It's full of human beings. But when it comes to character, to me, that relates to how you played the game, how you represented the sport. So you can easily tell the story of baseball with these guys. That doesn't mean they have to be honored among the best of the game. That's a difference. And a lot of people, and I'm talking about writers who have votes, conflate the two of them. Like, how could you possibly have a Hall of Fame without Pete Rose and Barry Bonds. Well, you know, we've had a Hall of Fame without those for years. The brick is still standing. People are still going. Their stories are still being told. It's about do you want to honor them among the best who ever played the game and who played it the right way? Yeah, speaking of history in the league, um, obviously we're going through a historic kind of uh, time right now with COVID. Uh, so what is that really like for you to be doing your job during these times in the pandemic? Well, I mean, it's good and it stinks. <laughs> it's weird because I don't know what we do without Zoom, right? We're here sitting here and we're having this great conversation. And thankfully I'm able to stay in touch with the people that I cover with it. And I mean, without it, I don't know what we would have done. The same token, we're stuck with Zoom. It's not nearly the same. The best thing about baseball is the human connection that it brings. Either us as fans going to the ballpark with family or friends and being able to see and even tangibly touch the game of baseball. Without that, without having people in the stands, man, there was a lot missing last year. And for me, it's the same way covering the game. Without the human connection, it's just not the same. It's still good, don't get me wrong, but it's not the same. What I love most about what I do is 
I'm able to talk with people who are the best in the world at what they do. And I can ask them questions about how they go about doing that. Those kind of things can serve me well as a person, even if I'm not a major league player, there's certain life lessons to be gained. Um, so without the conversations, the batting cage, in the clubhouse, in the dugout, I'm talking about conversations, not always you know, a strict interview, a question and answer, but just interacting with people. That's what I miss the most during the pandemic. And I really miss fans in the stands. I mean, if you paid attention to TV ratings in the last year, they're terrible across the board, right? Every sport, the ratings are way down. Why? Because you look at the games and it looks like you're watching a high school JV scrimmage with nobody in the stands. Take away the energy that the fans bring to the arena, to the ballpark. The game is just not the same. We've been reminded of how important the people in the arena are to the popularity of these sports. So I'm looking forward to getting back to that, even if it's 25% capacity, a lot of places to start out opening day. Uh, I noticed that last year, uh, they opened up the gates in Texas for the NLCS and the World Series. It was only 25%. So you're talking about 11,000 people in the stands. But man, it was cool to have that energy. And, and it was nothing like 40 or 50,000 people, but it was way better than nobody there. And I also was reminded of how much fun it is to see when a foul ball goes in the stands and people try to catch it. <laughs> I forgot with that how much fun that was. Instead of rattling around empty seats, people falling over themselves trying to catch a foul ball. Um, so it's really changed the job for the worst. I'm a little bit concerned that like a lot of things in this pandemic, we've kind of reestablished what normal is and things won't quite go back to everything that we knew baseball and life was like in 2019. In other words, access maybe is more limited. It becomes more structured, more formalized. I think it's a bad thing for the game because it's not just me that will be missing kind of the interaction. It's you as a fan, because when you think about it, you really want to care about the athletes who play the games, right? I mean, once you establish any kind of a connection, hey, I like this guy, you know, he's got an interesting family story. You begin to root for them. It's no different than you're watching a Netflix show, right? If the character is not developed, you're not binge watching that show. You're moving on. Well, you get drawn into characters, narratives, and stories. And that's really what journalism does at its best is to pull you, to tell stories, to pull you in by developing the characters. So if I can only talk to you in a formalized setting, chances are you're not going to come across the same way to fans, to readers, to viewers in the same kind of way. So I'm a little bit worried, actually a lot worried that maybe the access doesn't go back to as, as good as it was in 2019. I think it's super important. Now, I know it sounds selfish while well, you're on journalism side of the fence. So of course you want access. I, you know, it, to me, it's just as much about viewers and listeners and, and fans as it is us in the business. So you've written multiple books, like the Yankee years are chasing the dream. What are the differences or similarities between writing a book and writing for Sports Illustrated? Um, well, I guess it's the difference between running a hundred yard dash and running a marathon. Um, I've never given birth, obviously, my wife has. And after the first, it was like she said, never doing this again. Of course, we had a second child. So it's, it's painful. It's a lot of hard work. The reward is like 99% of it is being done. It's like if you run a really long distance, you feel great when you're done. Whereas if you're running a sprint or I'm writing a story for SI, I'm really, really into the process of it. And that's fun. So it, it's, it's hard work. A couple of books that I've written, especially the Cubs way after they won in, in 2016, had a very compressed time schedule. So <laughs> I didn't say, I don't think there was much time to really enjoy the process of doing it. Um, but it, it is energizing. It's, I like the um, sort of being able to stretch your muscles a little more in terms of getting really deep into something and writing something of that length. It's definitely a challenge. A lot of similarities, but a lot of differences as well. So after you finished up at Penn State, you went and had a short stint with the Toronto Blue Jays. And what was that like playing in a spring training in the MLB? I still can't even believe that happened. A quick story about that. I, my theory was, you know, covering baseball, my, what I want to do is try to bring you, the reader, into my stories or the game or the people as closely as I can. So I just figured, well, how do you get more close than actually being in the batter's box on the field? So 
I want, I had this idea of doing this participatory journalism story and I knew I didn't want to be a story myself while it was going on. So I couldn't really go to Yankees, Red Sox, Dodgers. So I called up the general manager of the Toronto Blue Jays, JP Ricciardi, and I told him what I wanted to do. I think the Blue Jays had finished in last place the year before. Nobody paid much attention to him. Uh, I fully expected him to say, you're crazy. There's no way that's happening. Instead, the first words out of his mouth were, yeah, just tell me when you want to come in. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, well, I'm going to be there, you know, first day of pitchers and catchers, first full squad workout. So he's like, full, yeah, it's fine. Come on down. We'll, we'll hook you up and, and we'll do the whole nine yards. So first day, um, it actually rained. We were scheduled for a live batting practice session on the field. And uh, Roy Halladay, the late Roy Halladay, who's pitching then for the Blue Jays, he was throwing in the cage. Now, Roy Halladay has been throwing on a mound to get ready for spring training for two months. So he's like in midseason form. So I'm about to step into the batting cage. So we're indoors because it's raining outside. I'm about to step in the batting cage against Roy Halladay. And the manager, John Gibbons, says to me, wait a second. I was like, what? He said, you did sign a waiver, didn't you? And I said, no. And he said, oh, my God, you're going to wind up owning this team, not writing about it. <laughs> and that's the amazing thing is I went in there, didn't sign anything. Nobody knew about it. Nobody wrote about it. Can you imagine? I was there as a journalist playing with the Blue Jays for a week, doing every drill, played an inner squad game, you name it, team meetings, and nobody wrote about it. I still am amazed about that. So it was even better than I thought because when the story came out, it was news to everybody for some reason. Um, so a couple of things stand out. Number one was how darn fast the game is. It, it's crazy at ground level. Television is so good. It actually makes the game look easy. And we all know it's not easy. It's hard. Quick story for you. I get to play in the one inner squad game and the guy on the mound was a major league pitcher, Chad Godin. I get in the batter's box and of course, if you ever had one at bat in your career and you knew that was it, right? You're not going to take the first pitch. So I made up my mind. If this thing's anywhere near the plate, I'm swinging. I am just letting it loose. I get three strikes, right? I'm not going to let one go by. So I made up my mind to swing at the first pitch. First pitch is a fastball. And he threw like 93, 94. First pitch is a fastball. Before the message got from my brain to my hands, the ball was in the catcher's glove. And I was like, I was like blown away. I had intentions of swinging the bat and the ball was already by me before I could even start. That was a wake up call. And listen, I've been for a week, been, you know, training against pitching and pitching machines and, and, and uh, major league pitchers and live BP, but this was different. This was a game situation, no screen or cage or anything like that. So I was probably nervous as well. So the second pitch, I, I gotta swing now right now I realize I better start swinging as soon as that message gets in my head swung and I missed fastball way out of my hands it was actually a really nasty pitch I, nobody I don't think could have hit it's a two seamer just running in on my hands so now it's two strikes right and what am I going to do and I'm not going to have the umpire call strike three so I swung the next pitch it was another fastball and I call it the greatest pop-up in baseball history managed to pop the ball up to first base and get out of there with having cracked my bat, but at least making contact on it. So the speed of the game was just crazy fast. Um, that's what stood out for me. So it was a couple of years later, actually, where I said, you know what, I've already played. How about I manage, uh, not manage, how about I umpire a spring training game? So I went to Major League Baseball and told my idea and they were stupid enough to say, sure, why don't you go do it? They wouldn't let me behind the plate. Uh, I'm sure for safety reasons. And uh, I did three innings at first, three at second, and three at third. And the same darn kind of impression hit me that this game is super fast. The speed of the pitches, the speed of the runners, the way the ball is moving, it's crazy. I remember a ground ball, it was a double play. It was a close play at first base. Uh, Mike Lowell hit, it was a Red Sox Orioles game. And it actually wasn't that close. I called him out, but I started guessing, second guessing myself. Like, was he really out? It just happened so quickly. And then when there's a runner on first base and you're umpiring second, you come in between the mound and second base. 
right? You have to make the call on a steal at second base. You can't be behind the base. You have to be in front of the base. So Kurt Schilling is pitching. Um, I think it was Schilling or I forget who was pitching. No, it was somebody for the Orioles was pitching because Manny Ramirez was up at plate. And Manny Ramirez like looked like he was three feet away from me. And I'm standing there and I'm probably 75 feet from home plate. And I suddenly had the thought that I'm not wearing a cup. <laughs> for some reason that came in my mind because he hits a line drive, I'm dead. I just felt like I was right on top of him. So everything seemed to be so fast and so condensed that I came away with so much more respect for the umpires and what, how hard their job is. It's like, to me, my working definition of greatness is to make the difficult look easy, whether you're a singer, a ballet dancer, a baseball player, or an umpire. They make the difficult look easy. And I remember them telling me, because I took like three or four days with the umpires to get a crash course in umpiring about positioning and something about the rules. But I remember them telling me that in baseball, unlike the other sports, you have time to get your head in a fixed position. So they think of themselves as a camera on a tripod. So it's all about positioning. If you're doing the NFL, NBA, soccer, you're moving, your head's moving, your eyes are moving. Baseball, you're only as good as when you get in the right position, your head is fixed on a tripod and you have a good clean look at the play. And you've noticed the really good umpires, it's exactly what they do. They're not making calls while they're moving. I thought that was fascinating because everything is so fast. You got to make sure that you are set to make a call. So real quick, did any, did any players ever give you crap for a close <laughs> call or anything or no? Oh, no my, my biggest compliment was the next day I was back at the Red Sox camp and I was talking, I don't know who I was talking to, but David Ortiz was right there. And somebody mentioned that, Hey, you did a pretty good job umpiring. And David Ortiz who had played in the game said, wait a second, you umpired. I said, yeah, I did the whole game. Three innings at first, three at second, three at third. So if he didn't notice me, that's really good. I did a good job. I didn't really mess up too badly. But a quick story for you was during the game, this is a spring training field with the cyclone fencing in the outfield. There was a play where a ball went up against the cyclone fence at the very bottom. And J.D. Drew was the center fielder. So a ball got there. He actually pulled it out and threw it back into the infield. Uh, then there was a third out. As he's running off the field, he doesn't recognize me, and he asks me, so what is the rule, by the way, if that ball gets lodged underneath the fence? And I'm like, well, the ball didn't go through the fence. It was still next to the fence. He said, no, no, I'm asking you, what happens if the ball actually gets down there and gets lodged? And I said, well, but the ball didn't get lodged. It, so what I was doing, I had no idea what the rule was. So I was totally stalling. And I stalled long enough so that the first base umpire, who's actually a legitimate umpire, came over and said, just put your hand up. It's an automatic two bases. Don't try to pull the ball out. And I said, yeah, just don't, don't try to pull it out. Put your hand up. It's automatic two bases. <laughs> so he didn't recognize me and I didn't know the rule. And it's a good thing it didn't happen. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like both those experiences, you know, nowadays they'd be like a 10 part series on Vice or YouTube or something like <laughs> journalist goes to try on spring training or something. Awesome. So throughout your years covering, uh, covering the sport of baseball and just in general, all your journalism experience, have you ever had any really cool interactions with players? Like when did you look back on and were like, wow, like he, he or she was a great, you know, great person, you know, they're cool to talk to, or just any times that you were just star, starstruck maybe. You know, you saw somebody that you're like, oh, my God, I can't believe like they are right in front of me. Yeah, it's funny. I, I don't get starstruck at all. And again, I think this probably goes back to when I was a kid. And my dad was coaching. When I was growing up, the guys I looked up to were like the stars in the high school varsity football team. I mean, really, more they were like bigger to me than, than major league football players, or NFL players or major league players. So I guess I look at it a little bit differently. So um Again, I, I think it's the opportunity to talk to people who are the best in the world at what they did, that they do. Like talking to Tony Gwynn about hitting, oh my goodness, I could do that all day long. Greg Maddox about pitching. I mean, you're talking about people who see the game at an entirely different level. Like I just get blown away by their knowledge. Um, what I try to do, and it's getting harder and harder just because of the way the world works. I try to understand, get to know people away from the field Generally, a clubhouse is like the worst place to interview people. It's like the cafeteria in high school or middle school. There's so much peer pressure, right? There's people milling about 
and probably eavesdropping. So players tend to be aware of the people around them and they sort of play to the role that they're supposed to play. So if you can remove those distractions and obstacles, I think you get closer to who the person is. So I like to bring people, you know, go to a restaurant, have lunch, dinner. Uh, I like to play golf. So I, you know, I've been golfing with a bunch of different guys. It's just a great way because they're relaxed. It also takes like four hours. So, and they can't run away from you. They can't go like, well, I got to go now. No, it's 18 holes. You're going to be here. So in a perfect world, I like doing that. But as I mentioned, it, it, it's harder to have players give a lot of time now off the field. It's just a busier world, uh, you know, they have now all kinds of layers of agents and reps and PR people and equipment companies who have lots of things for them to do. So their time is probably less than what it is off the field. And back in the day for SI, if you told somebody like Cal Ripken or Tony Gwynn, you're doing a cover story for SI, that was a huge deal. Not that it's not now, but it was a much bigger deal then. There was not as much competition for their time and so getting a, especially a cover story, but even at just the story in SI, they were like, okay, when do you want to do it? Now it's like, well, you know, I'll see where I can fit it in. Maybe you can meet me in the clubhouse tomorrow. Things just change. So I always like the opportunity to get to talk to people away from the field. So one of my favorite stories about that involves Derek Jeter. This goes back to the World Series in 2000. He was the MVP of the World Series, the Subway Series. You know, at SI, back then we were coming out on a weekly basis. So a lot of times the story that you read about the World Series, you didn't get to read that until like five days after the World Series was over. So you couldn't just write like a play-by-play -play story of how the World Series was won or lost. You need kind of a feature angle to it. So Jeter was clearly the story of the World Series. And I saw him, of course, after the game, it's crazy in the clubhouse, champagne, celebration, a million people around. And I told him, I said, I really need to talk to you for story for SI. He's like, no problem. He said, um, he said, you can, you can catch up with me. I'm having an after party tonight. It was some club in New York City. I was like, cool. So I went there and <laughs> it was packed. I mean, wall to wall. And that's not even doing it justice. I mean, you literally couldn't move. There's no way I'm doing an interview with Derek Jeter or anybody in that kind of place. It was nice of him to invite me there, but I somehow managed to find him in the mess. And I was like, this is obviously not going to work. And he says, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, tomorrow night, I'm going to dinner with my parents. Um, I will call uh, you. He said, I'll call you at eight o'clock when I'm done with dinner with my parents. And then we'll work something out. I was like, cool. So then I went home and on my way home, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I am totally screwed because I'm waiting on him to call me. Like I don't have his cell phone number. And if he doesn't call me, which 90% of players are not going to call you back. I mean, you just won the World Series. I'm covering the last thing on his mind. I have no story. I literally have no story if he doesn't call me back. Well, I tell people all the time, Derek Jeter is so responsible. His parents did an amazing job raising him. Right at eight o'clock on the dot, he called me up, invited me to his apartment in New York City. We sat down, had a really good interview, wrote the story, and... I mean, it could not have worked out any better. It was scary for a while there until eight o'clock when he did call me back. Um, but yeah, I mean, it would, it, it's a much better story getting him relaxed in a quiet setting than say, especially in a group setting after the World Series in front of his locker uh, or especially at a nightclub in New York City. So I realize it may be hard to pick, but out of all the games and uh, or series that you've covered, what's your favorite? Ooh, wow, it is hard to pick. Um, favorite game? Well, maybe because it happened for me so early in my career, going back to game six of the 86 World Series, Mets and the Red Sox, of course, the Bill Buckner, Mookie Wilson play. I was in the back of the press box. I was writing the lead story on the World Series for Newsday. And I was back in the back of the press box with my colleagues at Newsday, and we are figuring out what stories that we're writing. It was easy for me. I'm doing the lead story, Red Sox world champions, first time since, you know, whenever. Um, columnist is writing this story. Somebody's writing this story. And then Gary Carter gets a base hit. And then Kevin Mitchell gets a base hit. And we kind of stopped. And it was like one more hit. We're like, let's go back to our seats. So the energy that night was just amazing. People forget Shea Stadium back then had 50 some thousand people. It was super loud. 
And I've always said the best thing about baseball is not a home run. It's not a no hitter. It's a rally. When you can see things coming and anticipate things, that's when people are getting to their feet. That's when they're getting loud. Sometimes maybe it does, you don't even get the payoff. You know, the guy pops up, innings over. But there's nothing as good as a rally in baseball. So that just the kind of energy. And again, I was, was really young. It was probably only the second or third World Series that I'd covered at that point. And it was just amazing, the turn of events and such a quick period of time. And I'd been covering the Mets during the season. So, you know, it wasn't just like the year before I covered the Royals winning the World Series. It was great, but I hadn't seen much of them, if any, all year long. So that really stands out to me. Um, 87 and 91 being in the Metrodome for those World Series. Um, I don't think my hearing has recovered since then. It was so loud. You walked out of that place and it was like you were at an ACDC concert for four hours. I mean, it was crazy how it was constantly loud indoors. That stands out. You know, the Kirk Gibson home run. I mean, all these moments where games change really, really late and you kind of don't see it coming, but um, you know, it's corny, but it's true that, you know, baseball, you never run out of time. You just run out of chances. And that these games where things flip, where you're down to your last strike or down to your last out, there's nothing cooler than that. So I'd say mostly those World Series games. Um, the David Freese game in, in uh, 2011, game six, uh, I, I, people were there can back this up. He's coming to the plate in game six when he tied the game with a triple. And I stood up in the press box and I looked at Nelson Cruz in right field. And I said, he's way too shallow. You cannot let a ball get over your head when you're down to the last out of the first world series championship in Texas Rangers history. As like the next pitch, he has a fly ball over his head off the wall. I still can't believe that happened. It seemed obvious to me. Maybe everybody was just so giddy about the possibility of Rangers winning the world series. They weren't actually checking his positioning. But that ball should never have gotten over his head. But again, I mean, these things happen. It's the great thing about baseball. I mean, if you think about great moments of baseball history, it's almost always these great comebacks late in the game. Speaking of the World Series, what is your prediction for the World Series matchup this year? And who do you think will win it all? Well, I'll start with a disclaimer. Usually I'm terrible at these. Although last year, I did pick the Dodgers over the Rays in the World Series before the season started. My whole thinking was it was a weird season and nobody was really conditioned to pitch a lot of innings. So the teams with the most depth and pitching would win. And it's kind of what the Dodgers and the Rays were. Um, so we're back to 162 where all kinds of weird things happen. So my prediction going in is the Braves over the Yankees in the World Series. So we're going to do a, a redo of 1996, but with a different outcome. Uh, I just think the Braves, I, I was around them a lot in the postseason last year. I was really impressed by kind of the vibe around the team. The coaching staff is awesome. Um, really good pitching that they added to. Uh, you know, they were within, I think, 11 outs of taking out the Dodgers in five games last year in the NLCS. So they came really close to getting to the World Series. Uh, I just think they, they took a lot away from getting that close without getting it done. And now it's like, all right, we know we're good. There's a point where teams cross the line between believing they're good and knowing they're good. I'm talking about World Series good too, not just getting to the postseason. So I just got that vibe from the, being around the Braves last year. So um, I would go Braves over the Yankees and the Yankees are interesting because they can go in a bunch of different directions. All I know is that they're, they'll be in the postseason and it will come down to when they get to October, among three guys, they need two of them to really be in playoff shape. And that's Severino, Tyon and Kluber. They need two of those three pitchers to really be really good at that point health-wise. They don't need them for 30 starts each during the season, but to get to October with two of those three guys rocking and rolling, they're going to do some damage because they, they can just crush it offensively. I hope your prediction is wrong, but... <laughs> yeah, me too. But... Pretty good chance it will be, so you should feel good about that. <laughs> you should worry if you're a Braves fan. <laughs> Here, you mentioned uh, the great Roy Halladay earlier. His son now plays at Penn State. And, um, you know, Penn State's starting to get better and they're starting to get well-known for their baseball program. So what do you think is the best pitch for recruits to get them to come to Penn State? And how will Penn State really grow to 
become one of the top programs. Um, how about uh, Lebrado Field, right? I actually I was good friends with Anthony Lebrano. We lived in the same dorm, East Halls, Sproul Hall, freshman year. And I get to know him then, and, and especially through the baseball team. So we're still really good friends to this day. So uh, yeah, I'm not really kidding. I mean, the facilities are awesome. And, you know, I think if you really want an immersive college experience, that you will look on years from now and say, I had a blast. I learned a lot. It was everything I wanted college to be. You would go to Penn State. And, you know, of course I'm biased. My son actually, my oldest son went to Penn State as well. And I don't know many, if anybody who went to Penn State and said, nah, it wasn't that good. I wish I'd gone somewhere else. Um, you're the center of the universe when you're in college there in Center County, PA. And that's a good thing when you're in college because the world's going to get complicated enough anyway um, that for those four years, you're going to have a blast. You're going to have, you know, world-class professors to learn from as long as you take advantage of it. And the resources there are spectacular, including in the athletic program. So, you know, maybe it's not for everybody, you know, if you want, you know, a big time baseball program, or you, certainly if you want warmer weather, um, you might choose another school. But if you want the whole college experience, to me, that's the selling point of Penn State. And it's a selling point, unlike a lot of schools, that lasts beyond four years. And that's super important that somebody who's 18 years old probably doesn't understand, but the connections through alumni and resources and the school spirit that exists and remains, that is an asset that doesn't go away upon graduation, which happens in a lot of places. So, uh, you know, again, that's not going to impress a lot of people when they're 18 years old, when it's all about the here and now, but I'm telling you that if I were recruiting people, uh, I would definitely emphasize that, that you're going to have a great time, you're going to learn, you're going to have fun. Um, but you're going to have benefits that last beyond just your four years. Do you have any advice uh, for sort of aspiring sports journalists or current uh, college of communication students um, at Penn State? Um, you know, people trying to get into this industry, you know, it's really complicated nowadays, but if you get to give a few pieces of advice, what would they be? Yeah, a few pieces of advice. Uh, number one, read a lot. Reading is undervalued in the world today because we are so visual and communication is so quick and easy. Uh, I think just reading will definitely improve your vocabulary, your writing style, and it just makes you a better informed citizen of the world. Um, you know, we're in a world of specialization and I do that with baseball, right? I don't cover other sports, I do baseball. And I think a lot of viewership and readership wants expertise more than the generalist, so I get it. But I do think you need a breadth of knowledge to be good, even as a so-called expert or limited in your field to one specific specialty. So reading, definitely. Uh, number two, I mean, it's hard to fake passion. Hopefully you have it. That's why you chose this field. But rely on that passion to carry you through all the negativity and the times when things are, when doors are going to close on you because they will, you just mentioned it. And it is, it's an extremely competitive field. There's lots of people who want to get into it. Those who really want to do it to me, they will do it. I, I don't have any doubts about that. I've seen cases where people have outworked people to get ahead in this field. So that means taking any assignment, no matter how small you think it might be, or some radio station assignment that maybe nobody's listening to, getting reps in is that's invaluable. So um, you know, my senior year when I applied to, I don't know how many different schools I applied to in schools and newspapers. Uh, I remember coming back, and again, this is pre-internet, so it was all snail mail. And going to my mailbox and pulling out a whole stack of lever letters after Christmas break, every one was a rejection letter, um, but it didn't bother me because I knew this is what I wanted to do. I just, I hadn't knocked on the right door yet. And you have to have that attitude because otherwise it's too easy to stop because there'll be a lot of people saying you're not good enough. So believing in yourself, huge. And I use this line all the time because it comes from Vin Scully. When I asked him how he could do something this good for this long and still be so good at it, he said, it's the humility to prepare and the confidence to pull it off. Those two things are super important. Humility means 
you know what you don't know. You know, you're not a know-it-all, especially if you're just starting out. So you're open to ideas. You're certainly open to doing the prep work and the reporting and whatever it takes to get a job well done. And then the confidence to pull it off. I'm sure every one of you has someone who believes in you, parents, professors, teachers, friends, but more than anybody, you need to believe in yourself that you are going to do what you want to do because we shouldn't compromise. We shouldn't accept something that's not what we want to do because someone else told us we weren't good at it. Now, maybe there comes a point later in life where you have to accept that reality, but starting out, you should not accept that. The confidence that you have to have in yourself is something that only, you know, you can generate that. Hopefully you draw that from other people. But again, you have to have a belief in yourself, as Vince Scully said, to pull it off. So all those things are super important. Read a lot, be humble about what you do. That means knowing what you don't know and how much work it really does take. Be passionate about what you do. You know, don't let other people tell you what you can't do because it's very easy. It's like in baseball, they say the game's built on failure, right? And a lot of people will go out scouting, looking at players, you say, he can't do this, he can't do that. Well, what can he do? You know, he's gonna get a hit three times every 10 times up. Those three times, what does he do well? What do you do well? Play to your strengths and, and realize that, as you've said yourself, it's a very competitive business. Uh, I think it's a good thing and a bad thing that it changes super fast. It's a good thing because you never know where the next opportunity is going to be, whether that's podcast, streaming, there's lots of different platforms to, to make it in this world now, which is really cool. But just be prepared also to pivot. Kind of like me, never thinking I'd be in TV and here I'm doing a lot of television, uh, keeping yourself open to different skills and disciplines um, because those are just more opportunities. And again, I'll get back to what I said earlier that what we do is we're storytellers, right? People ask me all the time, are newspapers dying, magazines dying? They're evolving, okay? 20 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, people will still want a good story well told. And you go back to when the caveman came back from his hunt, what did he do? He painted pictures on the wall to tell the story of what he did. It's no different today. The platforms are certainly different, but we are all storytellers. How can you tell good stories well? Find the stories, tell them well, that will set you apart. So the last thing I'll say, you asked about advice is really be yourself. You know, if you want to be like everybody else, you're going to wind up being average and nobody wants to hire average there's something that you do that is unique to what you do it could be your perspective it could be your writing it could be your voice play that up you know that uniqueness of who you are as a human being is there's intrinsic value to that and sometimes it's not always apparent right away it takes a while even for you to discover your own voice but mimicking people not a good idea because that's not bringing out the best in you uh, learning from them? Absolutely. I mean, I still do that. I read something that I like. Oh, what was it about this lead or this term of a phrase? You know, how did he pull off, you know, set up this quote? Certainly learn from that. But stylistically, definitely be yourself because there's only one of you. Awesome advice. Tom, thank you so much. We can't thank you enough for coming on and uh, chatting with us. Cool. Thanks for having me, guys. And awesome, guys. That was our exclusive interview with the Tom Verducci, proud Penn State alum. Uh, it was awesome to chat with him. Yeah, definitely. Once again, we want to thank him for his time. You know, he uh, he spent more time with us than he needed to, and that was really, really awesome. So uh, thank you again to Jordan and Will for joining us. Uh, it's been another episode of Podvert State. My name is Sam Brungo. I'm Matt Pillis. I'm Grace Cunningham. Take it easy, guys. Have a good one. Yeah, show on the flip side, folks. <laughs>